Romans chapter 6, verse 6. We're going to go back there. This is our third message on this subject of we are not slaves. Tell someone we are not slaves. We, we've looked at the fact that we are not slaves to sin. You are not a slave to sin. You are not unrighteous. You are not unholy. And you are not unworthy if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Somebody say amen. So today, when we come to pray for people, the sin problem has already been answered. You say, but pastor, I did something wrong this week. So is God going to heal me? Yes, he will heal you because the sin problem has been paid for on the cross not by your good works. Somebody say amen. And it's a work of grace, not a work of, of man's own strength or man's ability. We looked last week at the chains of poverty. The chains of poverty have been broken over our life. Somebody say amen. Romans 6 verse 6 says, For we know that our old self was crucified. That's in the past. It's already taken place. God has already answered every prayer before it was even prayed because he's a God that's outside of time. And when Christ died on the cross, he took everything that, you would, that, you would, that the enemy would try to bring upon you and he broke it over your life because he's a God that created time. He was at the beginning and he's at the end, and he's everywhere in between. So he has the ability that when Christ died upon that cross, he took your sin, he took your sickness, and he placed it upon Jesus there and then on that moment. The price was already paid for. Someone say amen in this place. Hallelujah. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should be no longer slaves to sin. Tell someone I'm not a slave. Come on, tell someone else I'm not a slave. Sin cannot hold you. Poverty cannot hold you. But let me tell you today that sickness cannot and shall not hold you in this place, in Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Because verse 7 says, because anyone, someone say to the person next to you, that's you. You're anyone and you're everyone. For anyone who has died has been set free from sin. When we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our sinful nature died upon that cross when Christ died upon that cross. So we are not alive to sin, we are not alive to poverty, and we are not alive to sickness. We are alive to God. Someone say amen in this place. And health and blessing is your portion. Verse 8 said, now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We will live with him. The world, the flesh, and the devil have sought to enslave so many people. I told you that in the uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th century, that across the Americas, that while there was 12 million people taken out of Africa across the Americas, but right now they say across the world there are 46 million people in slavery even as we speak. But more than that, there are billions of people in slavery to poverty, in slavery to sin, and in slavery to sickness, when the truth is that Christ has set you free. Someone say amen in this place. I want you to listen to these words. Salvation through Jesus Christ is more than buying a slave and setting him free. It is adopting that former slave giving him the full privilege of his new family and doing away with his past. Tell the person next to you, your past has been done away with. Our spirit became dead to God and alive to sin when Adam and Eve fell. Our soul became corrupted and desperately wicked. Our body became slaves to sin, sickness, and poverty. But I want to tell you good news today. When Jesus died upon the cross, he reversed the curse and he re redeemed you eternally. Someone say amen in this place. Galatians 3 verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us. 
That means to pay back, to set free, to pay a price. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. Verse 14, this is so important. Look at this. Look at this. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. Turn to the person next to you and say, that's you. Unless we've got any Jewish people in the house, then you are a Jew and a Gentile. Well, we're all together. We're one. Someone say we're one. So what was the blessing that came upon Abraham? First, it was wealth. Secondly, it was health. But then also what was promised to him down through the ages would be the Holy Spirit coming upon mankind. That's the blessing. Now, Abraham never got to see the spirit aspect. He he got to see the wealth. And he got to see the health, but he never got to see the Messiah, and he never got to see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So that shows me that the health and the wealth were the lesser thing, and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit was the greater thing. So now now God has given us the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if he's already given us the greater thing, would he not give us also the lesser thing also? Somebody say amen. Health. And financial blessing are just the temporal things. The Holy Spirit is by far the best. So if he's giving you the best, he'll also give you the lesser. Someone say amen in this place. And if you qualified for the best, that means if you qualified for the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit has ever touched your life, then wouldn't God give you the lesser as well? Or if you were incredibly wealthy and incredibly healthy and hungering for the Holy Spirit, you'd say, I'm not good enough for the best one. How come you've got the best one, which is the Holy Ghost? So if he's giving you the best, he'll give you the lesser. Health and financial blessing are the lesser, but God wants you to have the whole package. Somebody say amen. Hallelujah. I want to deal with, and quickly, I'm not going to be long. I'm going to be real short today. Someone say, we've heard that before. (laughs) I'm going to be short today because we want to lay hands upon people as we're going to go back into worship and we're going to take communion and that healing anointing is going to flow like a river in this place. I want to deal with two chains today. Someone say two chains. The first chain is the chain of doubt. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 2. The chains of of doubt. And when it comes to receiving, because this is what we're about to do, you are about to receive. Tell someone I'm about to receive. You are about to receive. And what the enemy would seek to do over these next 15 or 20 minutes as we lead up to that is he wants you to come to a place. He wants to bind your thought process. He wants to bind your emotions in your life and cause you to think that everyone else in this room is entitled to receive, but you are not. And he will seek to sow seeds of doubt into your mind. When we come in prayer, doubt comes against us. Seeds of doubt, I want to prove to you today, I want to show you today that doubt is defeated by faith every single time. And if you have doubts, you see, the truth is, Every great man of God that I've met and talked to, they'll tell me sometimes even when I'm praying for people, doubts come to my mind, questions come to my mind, but God still does incredible things. God is bigger than the doubt that attacks your mind, amen? And we're going to break the power of the chain of doubt in this place so that you can receive freely from what the Father has for you today. John the Baptist Jesus proclaimed him to be the greatest prophet that had ever lived. He came and he shook the nation of Israel. He was bold. He was courageous. He was ferocious. As he went up and down the land, royalty paid attention to him. The government paid attention to him. People paid attention to him. He, he was this man that shook the nation because you have to understand that Israel had been in hundreds and hundreds of years with no release of the glory and the goodness of God. And then comes this mighty man of God, John the Baptist. And he comes and he, and he declares, prepare ye the way of the Lord. And he prepares God's people for the coming of Jesus. But here we see 
John's life of building the, the, the ministry and establishing the ministry of Christ and bringing him forth. And now John is in prison. John's been through a time of trial. John's been through a desperate situation. And here we see that doubt has come into John's life. Matthew 11 verse 2. When John who was in prison heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, hmm, this, this is the great John. This is the one who shook the nation. This is the one who moved in God's power. This is the one whom kings trembled when he spoke. He says, he asked him, are you the one? In other words, doubt had come to John the Baptist's thought life because of the situation, because of the trial, because of the prison. And so it is with many of us. We love God with all our hearts. We worship him. We know he's a miracle worker. But when the situation of pain arises in our body, when sickness is in our body, when we deal daily with the struggles of a disease or an infirmity, doubt attacks our mind. If it did to John the Baptist, it's going to for you too. Verse 3, to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another one? This is John the Baptist who said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus replied, I love these words. Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear, the dead arise, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Jesus essentially said, go back and give a testimony of what God is doing. Go back and encourage John. Go back and begin to tell him what you've seen and what you hear. The antidote to every doubt is a testimony of the goodness of God. And it's the truth of God's eternal word. It's the truth of his word coming forth in our life today. I want to tell you that God is a healing God. I want to tell you that he is a miracle working God. And if doubt is going and rushing around your mind, your wills, your emotions, I have the antidote to doubt today. It's faith. Faith can destroy doubt in every moment. What you have to understand is there is a difference between having doubt and being an unbeliever. Unbeliever. Now, if you are walking in unbelief, that says, I do not believe God can do it. He will not do it. And I don't believe there's anyone in here today that came believing that God cannot heal and that he will not heal. Maybe there's doubts that he will heal you, but you're not an unbeliever. You are a believer. Tell the person next to you, I'm a believer. Tell them I'm a believer and not a doubter. Let me tell you the difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt, listen, this is important. Listen to this. Doubt is not the absence of faith. Did you hear that? Doubt is not the absence of faith. Doubt is the questioning of faith. You see, we are built to question. And questions come from three dimensions. They come from the world. This, this world is filled with doubt. This world teaches us to question. Our flesh, our flesh teaches to question everything. And there's a good aspect to questioning things. And there's a bad aspect. And then doubt also comes from the enemy, from the work of Satan. He sows seeds of doubt. And it may be even that when hands are laid upon you, seeds of doubt will come against your mind. That does not believe, listen to me, that does not mean you are in unbelief. It means Satan is trying to sow a seed of doubt. And all you have to do is tear down those doubts with a word of faith from your mouth. Someone say amen. Faith will demolish doubt every single time. So you are not in unbelief. If anyone's ever told you, you haven't received your miracle because you're in unbelief, in the name of Jesus, that's a lie. Because you are a believer, not an unbeliever. Did you hear me? You're a believer, not an unbeliever. 
if you were an unbeliever, you wouldn't come to a healing meeting. You maybe come and, and you might be, have doubts in your mind and say, what's going on? But the Lord has brought you here today because there's going to be a miracle in your life. Someone say amen. Doubt is questioning what you believe. Unbelief is a determined refusal to believe. I'll say that one more time. Unbelief is a determined refusal to believe. Doubt is a struggle faced by the believer. Unbelief is the condition of the heart of the unbeliever. So there may come doubt to your mind when you're praying and when you're seeking God, but you have to understand where that's coming from. That's an attack of the enemy. He's getting desperate. He wants to stop you from getting your breakthrough. So he'll bombard your thought life. He'll bombard your emotions. He'll bombard your feelings with feelings of doubt and thoughts of doubt. But that's not unbelief because here you are pressing in. You've got your hands raised. Hands are being laid upon you. You came forward for a miracle and these seeds are coming against you. That's just simply doubt and that is destroyed in the name of Jesus. Because revelation destroys doubt. Amen? Faith destroys doubt. And I want you to know today that God's promise for you is yes and amen in Christ Jesus. That is, if God can heal the sick, he will heal you. And God can heal the sick. Somebody say amen. God is a healer. God is a healer. Someone say God is a healer. Hallelujah. Unbelief involves spiritual blindness and a determined resistance to God. That's not you. Tell the person next to you, that's not me. Then you have to also understand that faith, which overcomes doubt, is a work of grace. Faith is a work of grace. Let me read to you Ephesians, <coughs> Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And God raised, up, raised us up with Christ and seated at us with him in heavenly places. He seated us with him in heavenly places. Where did he seat us? In heavenly places. Is there unbelief in heavenly places? There's no unbelief in heaven. There's only faith in those heavenly places. So your spirit man is seated in a place of faith. Oh, come on. That was good. Your spirit man is seated, seated in a place of faith. You're not struggling to get to the place of faith, but you've, if you've ever queued up to go to the theater or go to the cinema and you've waited for a long, long time and eventually you get to your seat and you're sat there, you are seated in that place. That is your place. You paid for that ticket to that theater. You, that's your seat. And someone comes along and says, I think that's my seat. What do you do? No, you get out my, your ticket and say, sorry, this is my seat. And you have a little argument about whose seat it is. And you look at their ticket and theirs is row 15C and yours is row 15E. You say, this is my seat. I belong in this seat. I paid for this seat. Let me tell you that Jesus has purchased a seat for you in heavenly places. It's your place. It's where you deserve to sit. That place is a place of faith. It's a place of belief. There is no doubt in the heavenly realms, and you get to sit in that realm today of faith and a belief in Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. Tell someone, I've got my seat. I've got my seat. My seat is in heavenly places. It was purchased for me. It's got my name on it. Just as sure as if you would go on a website this afternoon and book a seat at a theater or a concert, it is already paid for. It's sorted. That belongs to you legally. I want to tell you today, legally in the heavenlies, you have a place seated in the heavenlies, a place of belief and a place of faith. So we come against every lie of the devil. That old demon comes to you and says, excuse me, that's my seat. Get out of my seat. You don't deserve this seat. No, in Jesus' name, we break those doubts in the name of Jesus. This seat was purchased. This seat was paid for. And you get to sit in it and you get to receive the blessing. Someone say, I've got my seat. Come on, tell someone else, I've got my seat. Hallelujah. First of all, the chains of doubt. Mark eleven twenty four says, when you pray, believe that you receive. 
And so when we pray, in a moment, you are going to be in a place of prayer. And at that moment, all you have to do is, at that moment, believe that you receive. Now, doubts may come to you even as you leave the building. Doubts may come to you next week. Even when you walk out and the symptoms are gone, you might think, well, 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 I, 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 I feel a bit better now, but what will it be like when I wake up tomorrow morning? No, in the name of Jesus, when you pray, believe that you receive. And that moment of faith comes. And when that moment of faith is activated, that miracle is released in your life. Someone say amen in this place. The first chain we break today is the chains of doubt. Tell someone the chains of doubt are broken. The second chain we break today is the spirit of infirmity. Someone say a spirit of infirmity. So there are two realms that we deal with. We deal with doubt that comes against for you receiving. But also we deal now in the spirit realm. You say that sounds a bit spooky. No, it's not. You are spirit, soul, and body. You, you are spirit, soul, and body. And you have an eternal life in the spirit realm. And we <coughs> need to be fully aware of what takes place in the spirit realm and realize we have authority in the spirit realm. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. On a Sabbath, someone say a Sabbath. What is a Sabbath? Sabbath is the day of Sabbath is the day of rest. Tell someone it's time to rest. Sabbath is the day of rest. So it meant there was no work involved. There was no effort involved. This was all about resting in something. On a Sabbath, Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. Someone say infirmity. Then he put his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised the Lord. First of all, it was a Sabbath. It was a thing that she entered into a, a place of rest. Let me tell you today, you cannot work up a miracle. You cannot work up a healing. You cannot deserve it out of your own ability. This is a place of rest and a place of receiving. There is nothing more that you have to do only to receive. Tell someone, I'm a receiver. I receive from God. Come on, preach with me this morning. Say, I receive from God. That's what you have to do. That's your only job is to receive. You don't have to work anything up. You have to just understand that the price was paid. You are entitled to it. Doubt is broken over your life. And every spirit we come against in Jesus' mighty name, we come against every spirit of infirmity in the name of Jesus. You see, that, that spirit of infirmity is a demonic force. Sickness comes from three realms. The world, this world that we live in, is, is polluted by sin and sickness and will cause sickness to come against you. All the different things that we eat, everything that's going on in the world, it leads to sickness. <coughs> the world, the flesh, we tend not to look after ourselves. We tend to abuse our bodies. We tend to eat too much and rest too much and sleep too much when we should be exercising more and eating better says the man who loves Big Macs and Kentucky Fried Chicken and Chinese. When we get to heaven, I hope broccoli tastes fantastic. <laughs> I think it will. I think we'll go, I don't want a Big Mac. Give me another piece of that broccoli. And oh, give me some of those heaven Brussels sprouts. And oh, give me some of that cauliflower. Thank you, Jesus. Angel, give me another portion of spinach, please. The world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil's job is to stop you from moving forward in life. He'll do it through sin. He'll do it through sickness. And he'll do it through poverty. Because if you ever rose up and realized what you could really do, you would shake your nation. You would shake your family. You would shake this world. Somebody say, that's me in Jesus' name. 
You are on planet earth to shake this place, to bring the kingdom of God, and to change this world for Jesus Christ. And the enemy takes seriously the anointing that's on your life. Some of you are doubting what I'm saying right now, but it's true. There is a commission and a calling upon everyone in this place to change their whole environment. So the enemy has to do all he can to stifle what God has placed upon, upon you. And he does that through sickness. He does that through poverty. And he does that through sin. But in the name of Jesus, it's broken in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Infirmity. Listen to this. This is how we tell what infirmity is. Infirmity makes you frail. Infirmity makes you sickly. It makes you weak. It makes you susceptible to infection. It can make you a a hypochondriac, always thinking about sickness and always thinking about disease. If you go from one sickness to another... If things are continually holding on to you over and over and over again, then I want to, I want to tell you today that there, we may need to deal in your life with a spirit of infirmity that is trying to grip you and to hold you. But in the name of Jesus, every spirit of infirmity is broken. Someone say amen in this place. Hallelujah. Worship team, would you come to the platform? Now there, John chapter 5 verse 2 says these words. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool which is called in Hebrew the tongue, the Hebrew tongue Bethesda. Bethesda means the house of mercy. Let me tell you there is healing at the house of mercy. The house of judgment, the house of performance, you cannot get a thing. But when you come to understand that we are in a house of mercy today, Tell someone I'm in a house of mercy. Jesus is that house of mercy. Which is called Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent or disabled folk, of blind, of halt, of withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the waters. Whosoever then first after the troubling of the waters stepped in, was made whole, and whatever disease he had. And a certain certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie there, and he knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, will you be made whole? Ask the person next to you, will you be made whole? The impotent man answered him, Sir, I have no man. When the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I am coming, another person steps down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was healed and took up his bed and walked. And that same day was the Sabbath. Someone say the Sabbath. So here again, the same day was the Sabbath, the day of rest. He received mercy on the day of rest. Let me tell you what Jesus does here. Jesus takes away your lack. Jesus takes away your excuse. And Jesus takes away your disease. Here he was, this man. It was always going to be someone else's day. That was it. Here he is by the pool. Here he is at another healing meeting. But he's never going to receive his miracle because he can't get in the water in time. It's always someone else's day. If that lie comes to you that someone else is going to receive, I break it in the name of Jesus. This is your day. I said, this is your day. This is the day of mercy. This is the day of rest. Doubt is broken over your life and a spirit of infirmity is broken over your life in Jesus' mighty name. This is your day. He came up with all the excuses why it couldn't be him. The enemy will try to place all the excuses why you cannot receive, but Jesus wipes them away in a second. Jesus wipes them and said, let's not worry about that. Let's not worry about who's in the water first. Let's not worry about who's the best prayer, who knows the word of God, who's lived the best life, who's done the best Christian works. 
right now you be made whole. The question was, well, maybe in, in three days' time when the water comes again, we'll get two or three people and they can throw you in straight away. Let's try and figure this out. Let's try and make a way for you to get your miracle. No, the question was, will you be made whole now? Let's get rid of every excuse. Let's get rid of every reason. Let's get rid of every doubt. Let's get rid of every spiritual force that comes against you. The decision is yours. Will you be made whole? Ah, not, not are you good enough? Not did you pray enough? Not have you attended church? Not have you lived right? But will you? And the choice came from this man, I will. And immediately, someone say immediately. Immediately he was made whole. 